working here. Is that on the speaker or the mic? So I'm not hearing it.
and sisters, good evening. Thank you for being here, those of us who are joining us in the Council Plus State Tech, and those who are joining us uh, in various states and the world, we don't call the, uh, the miracle of technology. We probably do that. Uh, that plays quite a bit tonight. Yes. I uh, will open uh, today's devotional, evening devotional, uh, by listening to a musical number, a oh, musical number by the Will be accompanied by Sean Blake. We will then uh, have an opening prayer message with Amy Smith. Her husband uh, just recently in the temple service for me. And they will be followed by a musical, uh, a, a video musical number uh, from my various primary children from around the state. Present. Wake me up, don't leave me behind. 
come before you this evening in a time of celebration and remembrance. We want to invite the Holy Father to join our Lord this Father to live in the gospel of the new sword upon the earth and preach his authority in the earth. I am so thankful for temples that God can let us have. We thank you, especially at this time, for our precious Winter Forest Temple that is here nearby, close to us, physically and close to our hearts. We are so thankful for our many leaders who have led the way over the years from the beginning of finding property to staffing the temple and making it possible that I would be done there. We thank you so, Father, for the work that is done in the temple to bless thy children on both sides of the veil. And we, we pray to thee, we plead with you, Father, that we might be able to soon return to full participation in the temple, that the plague that has been troubling us now for so many, many months will finally be conquered and we might be able again to meet in person. We ask thy spirit to be here in this room tonight. Bless us as we reminisce and remember the wonderful blessings and memories we have of this temple. How quickly 20 years have gone by, and how thankful we are to have been with these children. We say these things now and then in the name of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, welcome. We, uh, as a presidency and a state leadership, we are coming out of a time of disconnection, of fragmentation, fracturing. We were looking for something to, to unify ourselves, but to point ourselves towards and something to unify better. We, we decided that the temple would be that thing. We took note that this uh, spring would mark the 20th anniversary of the dedication of the Burn Orders Temple. We wanted to First, in President Jacob's file, I have to lose the grandeur of doing a big, huge celebration event. And we learned that the church only wants to sit on the 50th and 100th, 150th anniversary. So we just have to wait 30 years and see what we have in store for the 50th anniversary. It's coming. It's coming. It's amazing. Um, I have uh, taken on the task of, of putting together tonight a program and uh, reaching out to the previous members of, of the temple president. Them to share the feelings and memories and thoughts from uh, on the temple. They have such fond memories and 
feelings toward uh, not only the temple, but the people in their temple work. People had to show up to, to clean the temple, um, and, and everyone was, was thrilled to help out. Uh, so tonight's program will, will go as follows here in the beginning. So, um, I, I should know also, we, we put out the all of our stories and pictures, and had an email, and we compiled, and we're still compiling stories and pictures, and we're not entirely sure what we're going to do with all of them. We've got some sort of digital scrapbook of some sort, so we're still kind of deciding. But we're so grateful uh, for all the, the pictures and the experiences and the memories that you shared with us. There's so many wonderful talks. With some we, we have recorded, but we'll show you here later tonight. But there are so many more that, that haven't even made it to us yet. And, and we're looking forward to, to sharing those in, in some ways uh, as we determine. Um, before we, I, I'm inserting, I'm having a late addition to the program. We were first going to hear from, from Margaret Taylor, who served as the president of the Oklahoma State uh, during the time of the Temple of Mount, and during the time of the Temple Reconstructed. And he's going to speak to that time immediately preceding uh, the announcement and, and construction of the temple. From there, we are going to, uh, again, by miracle of technology, uh, we've recorded videos with uh, Marilyn and Carly Gaines, uh, who served in the first temple presidency. Uh, and then Seth, Sister Harbertson, whose husband served as the next temple president, she just sent me a text and just said, please share this with the state. So I have just a maybe a one or two minute um, text message to share with Sister Harbertson. Wonderful. Uh, and then we'll be able to hear from Marilyn and those of you folks, uh, also by video. Uh, and then we'll hear uh, from Brother uh, Mauricio, who served as temple president. And then we will share another video uh, with some memories from the time of the state. So we'll go ahead and proceed with that. Thank you, Brother Mauricio. Thank you, Brother Mauricio. Thank you, Brother Brothers and sisters, in October 1997 General Conference, President Equally said the following, quote, We will construct small temples in some of these areas, buildings with all of the facilities to administer all of the ordinances. They will be built to temple standards, which are much higher than meeting the house standards. They would accommodate baptisms for the dead, the endowment of service, savings, and all other ordinances to be had in the Lord's house for both the living and the dead. Now, as you hear me say these things, I think state presidents in many areas will say, this is exactly what we need. Well, let us know of your needs, and we will give them prayerful and careful consideration. But please don't expect things to happen all at once. We need a little experience for this undertaking. State president back then in the Omaha State, I felt the spirit prod me. So I promptly wrote President Hinckley's office, thank me for the letter, and acknowledged his receipt. In October 1997, a tremendous snow and ice storm hit the Omaha area. Um, president Maureen Schultz and I were in training in Chicago. At that time, with President Packer and President Butler was with us, of course, as well. President Packer felt impressed to cut out, cut our training meeting short, allowing us to return to our states. That was on a Saturday. Somewhere between leaving Chicago and the following Sabbath morning, the impression came to me to cancel the New Orleans State our Sunday meetings and in turn invite our members to spend their Sabbath. Their workloads out helping members throughout the city. And so the members did with great hearts of kindness and charity, as well as humility and obedience. Over a year later, on December 30th, 1998, a Wednesday, the impression came that Heavenly Father had something he wanted to tell me. I needed to pray and check in with him. However, on that same day, 8 p.m., Central Time, <clears throat> the Nebraska Cornhusker football team was to face off against the Arizona Wildcats 
in the San Diego Holiday Bowl competition. I was excited to see the game. So I made a mistake. I told the Lord I would pray and listen, but right after the game. So the game went on, I watched. It wasn't that exciting and Nebraska lost. I thought it served me right. I repented and humbly asked the Lord to forgive me, which he did. I promised that I would never do that again. And that my spiritual antenna, so to speak, would always be up, no matter what, 24 seven, always. I sought diligently since to never take it down, even temporarily for any reason. The Lord was merciful and did speak to me. He encouraged that in our state, we organize an effort to serve the city and its residents and offer to help clean up downtown city blocks, one block at a time with rotating unit assignments on multiple Saturdays. And that we should begin in the early months of the immediately coming year. So we did. The effort was very successful. Wards and branches would accept and fulfill their assignments faithfully. I don't remember if we we're out in the streets of Omaha week by week or whether it was scheduled for every other week. I think two units at a time would combine for each Saturday block assignment. The efforts continued into the late spring or very early summer. Then the announcement came. On June 14, 1999, the church announced that a temple would be built in Omaha, Nebraska. We were ecstatic. I subsequently received word from the area president, President Pinnock, that President Hinckley would fly from Palmyra to Nauvoo to Winter Quarters to look at temple sites. I was to pick him up and escort him from the private flight once landed in Omaha. <clears throat> That day came and he visited in Palmyra. There was bad weather in Nauvoo, so they flew over that location. They landed on time at the private Omaha FBO Air Base at Epley Airport. I picked him up and we went to see sites. Our first visit was to the Mormon Pioneer Cemetery, which was then owned by the city of Omaha and leased to the church. There was a couple acre orchard directly to the south of the cemetery. And I might say the church owned that then. From the west side of the cemetery orchard, we ascended the hill. Back then there was a fence around the cemetery. President Hinckley walked up from the orchard side to the southern cemetery fence. I knew I should give him some prophetic, some private prophetic space and lagged a few yards behind. When he was at the fence, he looked over at the cemetery and then said back to me, the city doesn't need this. They should sell it. They should sell it to us for a dollar. I listened. I also noted the price. One dollar. When we subsequently traveled over to the Winter Quarters Visitor Center, he greeted some who were there. I think President Schoff was there, President Butler, I think. So also was Elder Truman Clausen, then director of the center. Afterwards, he went outside. And when he arrived at what I would call the North South sidewalk, the sidewalk in the parking lot, <clears throat> in front of the visitor center, while looking over towards the cemetery and orchard, he gestured with his arm, his arm outstretched toward them one at a time and said, we'll have the dead and the work for the dead, side by side. Shortly after his visit, we received some sketches of the proposed temple. We proceeded under temple department's direction to request the purchase of the cemetery for one dollar and the permission and exception for the height of the angel Moroni to build the temple. Brother Chris Curzon had a good prior and current relationship with then Mayor Hal Dahm. 
We approached Merdog jointly with the sketches in hand and indicated the church's desire to build a temple and to acquire the cemetery for one dollar. Merdog was very supportive. However, we needed city council approval. So the documents were prepared and the issue was submitted to city council. Our Catholic friends from the Notre Dame sisters located across the street from the cemetery had come to speak in support. The item on the agenda just before us didn't go well. The council was quite antagonized. In fact, one council member said, I would hate to be the next item on the agenda. Of course, that next item was us. We made our presentation and our request. Our service in the city was known and appreciated. The council approved our request on a five to zero vote. We were thrilled and very grateful to Heavenly Father for preparing and providing the way. Brothers and sisters, I leave my witness to you of Jesus Christ. This is his house. We all love him. He's our friend. He helps us in hard times and good times. And through him, through the covenant pathway, which goes through the temple, we can all return to live with him and our Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, we are grateful to have uh, Beryl and Carly Hales here. Uh, they served as, uh, he served as the second counselor in our first temple presidency under, temple, under uh, President Butler and as temple reporter. And Sister Hales served as uh, assistant matron. And they served from 2001 to 2004. And we are so grateful to have them join us here uh, from their home by the miracle of technology that lived uh, in the Sacramento, California area. But they were lived for a long time in the Omaha, Nebraska area. They still cheer for uh, for our corn huskers, uh, which, which we're grateful for as well. Uh, we want to turn the time over to them for a little bit, and they're going to talk about those, those early days of the Winter Quarters Temple, uh, preparing for the opening, the anticipation of the opening, the announcements, uh, a little bit about the, they were also on the committee for the open house, so they can talk a little bit about serving uh, during that time. And of course, the circumstances around the calling, uh, the dedication, maybe those those early memories of the winter quarters. So with that, I'll just I'll just let uh, you, Meryl and Caroline, just kind of take it from there for, for a few minutes. Well, I want to I want to start by saying that the last time we remember uh, you, President Jacob, was when you were a young kid, uh, a good kid, I might say, but still a young kid. Thanks for the mail for that. You never know what the Lord's going to have in mind with the Lord's when we're willing. And the same goes with uh, with the President Bartlett. Uh, who would have thought that this kid that uh, gave me such uh, anxieties as a scoutmaster would some, someday be a, a state president and attempt, or a recent president, now the temple. So we never know. There's hope uh, for all of us. <laughs> but also, who would have ever thought that after uh, 14 hours of driving and soft things our temple, uh, temple and and many years later, when Dallas was uh, dedicated as a temple, we were down to 10 hours and then nine hours in Denver. And then we just kept moving to closer with uh, Chicago at eight hours and St. Louis at seven hours. And finally, we thought we'd never be alive by the time they got a bit closer, closer to us. But suddenly there we were at uh, the forest in Nebraska, which was really ground in Warren Cemetery. And we had the temple. And there were still some of the areas that went. Peter Hoover, still a few hours away, but right there uh, next door to us, uh, we had a temple. But it didn't come with a, without a lot of preparation by people. Uh, people who in that area were doing their family history work and, and then going those, those distances that we just mentioned uh, to do that work. Uh, and even those who, who couldn't go to the temple, uh, just being worthy to hold the temple recommend and uh, showing the work that we. Uh, 
appreciated what he was doing. Um, and I remember uh, years before, or sometime before that the temple was built, we had a very fourth site for that's a word. Uh, the state president who organized work parties to help uh, our next door uh, neighbors, the Catholic neighbors who were refurbishing their uh, convent there. Uh, years later, uh, when we, the church applied for the temple, these same Catholic neighbors went before the city council and testified what a good neighbors we would be and what an asset to the community the temple would be. Uh, what a blessing that was for all the preparation went into the building. And um, a fun memory for us was when the temple was being built, those beautiful stained glass windows that were um, designed by Tom Holder, the specific for winter quarters, um, they were delivered before they were actually ready to install them. And so they were being stored on the temple grounds there. And they asked for volunteers to um, come and guard those windows until they could actually be installed. And so Nero and I um, volunteered to do an overnight shift, and um, we spent a cold, quiet night peacefully watching over those um, very precious windows. And during that time, we were able to think about all the things that had happened in that sacred spot. And we just felt so grateful for, for the sacrifices that had been made there, and we, we marveled at the thought that a temple was now being built in that special one of the memories that, uh, that still comes to me when I think about uh, those young people at, at the open house, kneeling down and putting on the and what a, what a tender moment of time that was for uh, those people participating in, in that temple preparation. Now, so speaking of the open house, with it being in April, we were worried about um, the possibility of rain. And so um, Dave Edwards of Council Plus he generously offered to buy 100 umbrellas for visitors to use um, walking between the visitor center and the temple. And so um, President and Sister Rowe, mission president at that time, they had a membership to Costco. And so I went with Sister Rowe to buy these umbrellas at Costco. And there we were standing in line um, with um, several carts full of umbrellas waiting to pay. And Sister Rowe, of course, had her missionary badge on. And a customer came up to us and he kind of looked at her badge. And he looked at all those umbrellas and he said, excuse me, but do you know something we don't know? Those are foolish. But we did it in my case. Come with the, come with the house. One of the things you're asking me about the president is uh, some of the counsel that President Lincoln may have given this when, when he was there. There's two things that came to my mind when you asked that. The first one was that the president told us, President Lincoln told us that when, once the temple was dedicated, it would be a working temple and we were to no longer conduct tours through the temple. And that stuck with us. So we didn't do that. Uh, and one of the other things that he counseled us on was uh, he said when, when we were asking answering questions that the patrons may have, he said, as a temple presidency and the position that you hold, uh, these people may tend to take everything you say uh, right. And he says, you actually may be limiting their understanding of that, of that question. He says, the Holy Ghost is the teacher in the temple, and you need to let the Holy Ghost do the teaching. And then he made a very uh, humbling statement. He finished off by saying, besides, you just might be wrong. <laughs> and so that, that was humbling to us. And, and his present English style. And speaking of his style, uh, we, when, uh, those of who, who may have been in the first session of the uh, dedication, uh, when President Hinckley was exiting to go up to the personal ceremony, they remember his taking his cane and as he walked by them, he went waving his cane. And I don't know it was in defiance of, of uh, that he just did not have to use that cane, or it's just his way of saying thank you for being here in his style. It was, it was just, uh, it was present.
Um, actually, the day of the dedication was, was quite cool and overcast. And uh, during the last session, just as the choir began to sing the Lord's Prayer, this huge bolt of lightning struck and thunderclap just right outside the uh, window of the celestial. And it, it literally lit up the whole room and, and started us. And, and um, it seems like a heavenly manifestation. But President Hinckley just didn't seem surprised. He just kind of took it in stride. And, and maybe because um, things like that are not totally uncommon in Indian temple dedications, but we were completely awed by it. We remember that well. One of the things that those of you who were present that first year may remember some of the challenges that we had physically with the things that happened with breath and any of them. But particularly here, for example, uh, during that summer, the air conditioning went out. And we found out that the as they prepared the, the, the built the temple, they had installed air conditioning with kind of only about two thirds of what needed for for midless summer. And uh, so during that time that, that the air conditioning was out, um, fans became a fixture in the, in the, in the downward rooms. And uh, I, I wonder, I was here during that several weeks that it took for to get it upgraded. But I wonder if the uh, Lord might have been reminding us that, well, our forefathers, when they were in the forest, they didn't have air conditioning. Uh, and but that didn't dampen their, abandon their, their faith and, and their commitment to the gospel. And neither did it do ours. Uh, we were uncomfortable, but we were grateful, just grateful to have the temple there, even though we had some and sometimes it was as it is now. Okay, one more really, really special memory that um, I'd like to talk about is that group of ordinance workers and office workers who we relied on as we began work in the temple. We loved them. <laughs> they were they were they were our friends. They were the, the people who rode on those red eye buses to, to other temples. And now we were serving together in our winter quarters temple. It was just amazing. We we felt so blessed to be serving with these good people. And their dedication was, was inspiring. You mentioned that, that I was the uh Report of the temple, but really the first people who did their the work there was Sister Carol Ludlow and Joan Shelf <laughs> and the secretary of the temple. And they were there the ones that took the temple for all the time. But there we were. Uh, dedication came, the temple uh, the servant of the Lord of Prophet of the Lord had come to dedicate this temple uh, to the glory of our Father. And what a glorious day it was. But you know, even more glorious than that day was the days and the weeks and months that followed as faithful saints came to the temple just to show the Lord they filled the, they filled the temple beyond capacity, to show the Lord their dedication and thankfulness uh, to Him for gratitude for bringing the temple so cool to us. And, I have thought that perhaps we, like Oliver Cowherd, when he was talking about the early days of the Restoration, uh, we could also say those were days never to be forgotten. We were so grateful to have the, the temple there, but now we have the responsibility and the uh, challenge to keep the temple full. And perhaps when we're able to do that, Again, uh, to show the Lord our gratitude for not only the Mount Vernon Temple, but the temples throughout the world. Uh, to show our thank you for being able to participate in this great work of redemption. And so, we're so grateful to you, President, for inviting us to be to be part of this dedication. We're grateful to be able to be with you, even though it's virtually. Uh, and so thankful for time that we had and the members that we have and we got to spend hours with Yeah. We love the Leonard Porter sample. <laughs> well, well, thank you to, to both of you for, for your time, uh, for your service, uh, and for all
job that you did to um, to share with us of your spirits and, and your experiences and your memories. Uh, we've, we've truly been been edified by them, and we look forward to uh, to taking that counsel and, and returning them from the ones to learn. So, thank you to both of you, and, and thank you. We wish you the best. Thank, thank you. you. Sister Harbison uh, served with her husband uh, following uh, President Butler and, and, and the Hales. Uh, Sister Harbison had, a, had some family things uh, happening that just prevented us from kind of connecting. So she said, well, I'll just, I'll just send you a text and you can just get up and read it for me. So I said, that's, that's perfect. So she says this in her text, my message for the devotional. My great grandfather was Ira Nathaniel Keithley who on his way west stopped and built a house of split logs in winter quarters for his aunt who could not continue the journey. When President Gordon B. Hinckley set my husband Bob and me apart to preside over the Winter Quarters Temple, he said he wanted a family member to be on that sacred spot. And Bob understood that desire. As matron, I would go alone into the celestial room each day we served to pray before the temple opened. It became like my home and the ordinance workers and staff were my family. We were able to do laundry, clean the building, bring our sack lunch, help 10 little children while husband and wife took turns going on a session. I was sad there was no organ there for me to play. It will always be the highlight of my life of service in the church. A beautiful large photo of the sacred temple that our son took hangs here in my home. I send my love to whomever I knew that may be there for this commemoration and for all who enter its doors. Uh, we'll now have uh, Meryl and Josephine Oaks. Uh, the connection is, is not as good. Uh, we're hoping that it, that it comes through okay. We'll, we'll try to turn the volume up a little. We're gonna skip a small portion where it, it, it didn't come in too well, but um, still plenty of time with, with brother and sister Oaks. All right, we are here with Meryl and Josephine Oaks, who served as our temple president and temple matron and Winter Quarters Temple from 2007 to 2010. And by the miracle of technology, we have them here from their home, uh, where they now reside in North Salt Lake City, Utah. So first off, thank you so much, President and Sister Oaks, for, for being with us uh, this evening. Uh, as we talk to, to the Council Plus Iowa State and others who are tuning in, uh, commemorating the 20th anniversary of the dedication. So first, uh, I just want to ask you a little bit about your calling, how, how you received your calling, what you thought when you were called to serve as the, as the Winter Quarters uh, Temple President and Matron, and, and what plans you made on, on moving to Omaha. And if you guys just want to spend a few minutes on, on those thoughts, that would be great. Yeah, well, um, I had served as for a while. And it's that time up and we were feeling a little bit losing it. And I wanted to go on a mission. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, as we're announcing, we were the temple family history. All of us, the president of the church, we want to make a lot of asking to extend the call. And we commented later, we never. If you could call a couple that were more excited to serve <laughs> him, it would show me going back there. <laughs> and uh, there were things to be done. Uh, well, Joe had to have a little surgery on his foot, and he was trying to go back, and it turned out we were getting very strong that time last year, and my patient realized. Um, and of course, I'm not going to talk to all of this, so I'll do something about that. We bring it all up, prepare them all from all the different universities online. And uh, he was a deep part of We had a very good medical care there, but we had to have a lot of But we did this work around, and uh, we did the we didn't have that far. Putting off our time of coming, that didn't work very well. But so we just come over here, stop and came. And, and then everybody else, and when she was a little bit angry, everybody else, and it just worked fine. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Sister Alex, do you have any, any memories of, of receiving the call? Oh, yeah. Uh, we were so excited. We were just about numb. We were just so thrilled to be calling and we knew that it was a blessing in our life to be able to, to come and to leave our family. We got nine children. They were all taking care of themselves pretty well. So we just left and invited them to come and visit us at any time, which they did. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Did you were you given any counsel when you were when you were given a calling or, or set apart? Was there was there any counsel that you remember? Uh, President Larry had just been called to the council. Uh, he's just been called to the council. And that was the president of the big structure. We had a good delivery of the problem from other situations where we were stressing in front of him to the And we didn't go there. We were really comfortable.
the most important to be on the town there is when you're going to the general. And so if you sit on the calendar ahead of time when you're going to the temple, then you have a goal to reach, you have a goal to reach, and you don't make excuses, you just get there because that's the most important thing to do in your life. Uh, and that really helps me. Uh, and I think that that it, it's helpful to do that kind of thing. Absolutely. Wonderful. Put it on the calendar. Yeah. Absolutely. Prioritize it. Put it on the calendar. As we were thinking about this, I went back to the specific word. Yeah. Give it up one. This website has more financial than the people. And there was just a little bit of something here that I thought was beautiful. It doesn't need to be fair. We pray for all those who will serve here, whether they be workers of faith, may the hearts of all who live in this temple to serve them and serve their spouses. May the people go with them to be ready to learn from you. And to the serve them all. We pray for all who serve here in any capacity. That's the hearts of our people for the great desire and comfort of you and our own God. I think that's very unfortunate for what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. And I think this experience in the recording channel was one of the most spiritual experiences that we have ever had. And it was so hard for us to have to leave them the way we thought. The only place that we had fallen in love with. So we had served and they had served the Lord in the temple. Um, and it's the most, as we go through and read our journals and our history, here's this law because the Spirit of the Lord um, witnesses to us how important this temple is. Um, that's where we have our spiritual food. Of course, our food is very important to. In our lives, but the temple is where we have make friends with the Lord, and it's such a blessing. Perfect. Yes, perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brother Sister Rose. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for your time. We we love and we miss you, uh, and we are so grateful for uh, for your service here in the Winter Quarters Temple, uh, and uh, we are so grateful for uh, for your words of counsel. For your memories and, and all that you shared tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Greetings to all. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm uh, grateful to see President Taylor. It's been a long time. The, his leadership in the early days of the temple of dedication and planning for all those sort of things was monumental to get it all done. His organizational skills were fantastic. And it was just amazing to see how things pull together when about 48 hours before the beginning of the open house, there was a major change made. And instead of having a tent out in front of the temple, the visitor center became the gathering place for everybody to get to before they uh, went over to take a tour of the temple. But it was just a bunch of things. Uh, just some thoughts about the temples to me. In the uh, 13th verse of the 109th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, it said, And though that all people who enter upon the threshold of the Lord's house may feel thy power and feel constrained to acknowledge that thou hast sanctified it and that it is thy house, a place of holiness. One morning about uh, nine o'clock, the phone rang at the temple house. And as I answered the phone, it was Salt Lake, the security people in Salt Lake saying, there's a fire in the temple and the fire department is on their way. Well, quickly over to the temple and the fire department had already come. 
They'd gone to the uh, north gate and couldn't get in, gone down to the south gate and couldn't get in. And finally, uh, we got the gate open, they got in. And then two firemen, fully clothed in their fire gear, one of them carrying one of these funny little axe things that the fire department carries as they go, said, we have to go into the temple and see where the smoke is coming from or where the fire is. So we went in down the basement, could only find a, a smoke detector that probably had some dust on it, concluded there was a fire. And so I was about to escort them out of the temple and they said, no, we have to see every room in the temple. And so uh, here we go, these two big firemen from the fire station up there north of the, just north of the temple. Both of them could have been linebackers for Green Bay uh, anytime, carrying this big ax as we went through the temple. But as we want, walked and as we went from place to place, they felt something. They felt something special about the building and they commented about, there's a special feeling here. There's something unusual here. And they were very, very reverent, despite being dressed and being kind of rough looking guys. They were very, very, very reverent in what they were trying to do. And I reflected back on that, that yes, that 13th verse, they crossed the threshold and they felt that special feeling. And I hope that you would do that each time you cross the threshold of the temple, you feel that special feeling also and what that really means. While we were there, we also had a major upgrade to carpeting and wallpaper and things like that. And uh, the, the crews were all members of the church. And so they would come and they also had interesting hours. Some liked to work from six in the morning until nine or 10 at night. Others liked to come in at 10 o'clock in the morning and work until two or three in the morning. So different crews. But uh, one morning I we were over there, the carpet crew would come in first and they'd done some carpet tear out the old way, ripping up, up my hand. And this particular morning when I got over there and we were getting started, uh, I didn't pay much attention to what was going on. And all of a sudden I could hear this motor running in the temple. And I went upstairs onto the second floor and there was this machine, looked like a snow plow, but with a pointed blade on it, tearing the carpet up in the temple, running on gas in the temple. It just was desecrating the temple in uh, my view of what was happening. And Joan made the comment to me when I talked to her later that day, she said, remember, the temple isn't a working temple now, it's a meeting remodel temple. And that was a common experience to have. Those workers were extremely reverent. They took out the windows and put them back in. They did wallpaper all throughout the building. And I defy you in some of those areas to see the seams where the wallpaper was leaked from piece to piece to piece uh, throughout the temple. They just were a very reverent group and a wonderful thing that they did. And we had a wonderful time just visiting them in that process. Uh, as uh, and Brother Beck came in, I don't know where he is, but he came in, I thought about the day that I watched him and two others carry somebody up the stairs in a wheelchair when the elevator was in its typical didn't work fashion. Uh, but it was just fun to see that here, here these people were willing to help get somebody to be able to go and do an endowment uh, in the Winter Quarters Temple and carry it up the stairs and then later carry that lady back down the stairs in that process. Joan used to, at the end of the night as we would, and by the way, she's not feeling well tonight, but as we would uh, get ready to leave the temple at the, in the evening, she would go through turning off the lights. And when she turned off the lights in the celestial room, and I think you heard that from Sister Hales and, and Sister uh, Harbertson. She just simply, simply said each night, good night, Lord. And that feeling was there that she had that opportunity to be that close and be able to say good night, Lord, as the temple was put to bed, if you would, and rested for the next day. And that was just a wonderful feeling to feel that and feel that closeness that was there. Many spiritual experiences happen in the temple, uh, and you're well aware of those. Many of you have had your own there. I uh, recall one evening standing at the top of the stairs for the seven, just before the 7.30 session started, and this brother came up the stairs, and he looked like he had the world on his shoulders. He looked like Atlas with the world on his shoulders. Big, big guy, husky guy. And I looked at him, and I said, I know who he is, I, I, I know who he is but who is he? I can't remember his name. 
and he came up and he went into the endowment session and did an endowment. And at the end of the endowment session, the workers had gotten finished and they were all coming down and the change were going home. And he was still in the celestial room. And the shift coordinator was there with him uh, as we had that policy. But he just was just lingered forever in the celestial room that night. And then when he finally came out and came down the stairs, it was as if he was floating, it was as if he felt something very different. And in the 32nd, 22nd verse of that 109th section, it says, Then we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, and that thy name may be upon them, and thy glory be round about them, and thy angels have charge over them. I learned that he had just been called to be a bishop, a new bishop, and was this his first opportunity to really weigh in, if you would, with the Lord as a new bishop. And he felt that weight of the world lifted off his shoulders as he prepared them to begin his service as a bishop. Now, the reason I didn't recognize him, he used to have a beard. And when he came up to the temple stairs, no beard since he'd been called to be a bishop. So then we could recognize who it was. There are just so many memories from the temple. We just, it was just such a wonderful experience. The faithfulness of you, back up a little bit further. The number, of, and was, I think the Hales mentioned, the number of uh, bus trips, uh, Salt Lake, Provo, Dallas, uh, Chicago, Denver, St. Louis, the number of temple trips. And, and those several of you who are here tonight worked in the St. Louis temple could go, it was an apartment rented. You'd go over and spend a whole week working in the St. Louis temple, helping out there. That dedication and that devotion, I think, is typical or example of what the dedication is to those who serve in the Winter Quarters Temple. There's a special feeling there. Maybe it's that feeling of trying to honor those who made this place possible, who were the ones who are responsible for that cemetery and the lives that they gave in helping build Zion in those early days here at Winter Quarters. Maybe it's simply because of the love of the Lord that ties that together. But there's a great dedication from the workers and those of you who served, thank you so much for all you do, and what you've done to make it special. People who have visited the temple always talk about how friendly the workers are. And for many of you, you know, you get to the point where you know everybody on your shift and you know everybody else is coming and that special bond that is there between you is a very important thing to think about. So as we see the temple reopen soon, hopefully, it'll be a great opportunity to be able to go back and be able to serve, to be able to again feel that special spirit that's there, to remember those who are buried just over the fence and what they gave their all that we might have this property and to have the temple there. And for those who have made it possible for the, through the construction and the other things, just a very, very special time. Grateful for all that you do. I know that the Lord's house is dedicated for doing the work on the other side of the veil, but I think it also does an awful lot for us on this side of the veil as we go there dedicated, reviewing our worthiness, ensuring that we are worthy to serve and it blesses our lives also. May you find joy and peace in serving the temple. May you find opportunities to do family history work while you're waiting for the temple to reopen. I would ask in Jesus' name, amen. President Warren R. Nelson made a comment to everybody in the Valley of Nebraska State that we knew the world at the temple. And so that means we weren't going away with having to do bus trips. We went on many bus trips. And then later, we had on uh, January 23rd, 1999, as we were in the tabernacle, the door opened and then walked several brothers. And one of them started walking close to us where we were at. And he asked, and we were surprised that it was present for me deeply. And we discussed the tabernacle situation later on the church took over the tabernacle. 
But he says, Brother Matt, what would you like to see happen here? I said, we'd like to have a temple and we'd like to have a state. And he says, Brother Beck, you're not going to get your temple in Iowa, but you're going to get your state. And sure enough, we did get our council on state. And that's the reason why we were eventually, President Hinckley came and after the temple was built, came and dedicated it on April 22nd and 23rd of 2011. And we've been enjoying many experiences in that lovely temple. Hi, my name is Rose Bullock, and in 2001, I was 15 years old. I was asking a lot of big questions about life and death because I had lost three grandparents in two years. So I was attending church with a lot of friends in order to find answers. But I had been avoiding going to one particular room of church because I knew her telephone rules. Her name was Kim Ellis and she was a rock star. I thought that attending her church's temple open house was harmless enough. It just turns out I was wrong and I felt something significant in the celestial room of the temple. I didn't want to tell her right away because it wasn't something I was expecting or even had a name for. A couple weeks later, I did go to church with her, and the missionary was to a meet. And I was sure that what I had felt in the temple was the fact that I had found a place where I could have my salvation. I was about 10th in August of that year. About a year before the dedication, that was 20 years ago, um, they asked me to be the organist for the temple dedication choir. Of course, I was honored. Um, there was a small hand-picked choir, and we practiced every Sunday for about nine months, every single Sunday. We had three songs that we had chosen, um, the first one, but the second one was, um, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, and the third one was A Spirit of God. We were very diligently practicing those three songs every week, um, and we are all super honored and excited about the dedication. President Hinckley got there, gets up to give his talk, and he said something like, of all the places in the world for a temple, this dedication needs to have come coming saints. We need to have come coming saints. Well, we had a practice come coming saints for nine months, but we were happy to oblige. And of course, we sang it beautifully because we knew that song very well. The spirit was tangible. I knew that if I let myself feel any of it, that it would be over. Um, I knew that I would just have tears overflowing and the, the word, the notes would be blurry and I couldn't see the, see the music anymore. So I held it all in. The spirit was so powerful. Um, I stepped off the organ and bench and literally collapsed the floor because I was weak and overcome by the spirit. So we had a very busy weekend planned, April of 2016. We had a son in law graduating from college. We had a baby blessing. We were moving my daughter and son in law to Iowa. And we we're going to do my daughter's endowment because of a mission call. And all this was in Utah. Well, all that changed really fast when my mother in law, Denise Beck, passed away. That meant all of our children were coming to us here to Iowa instead. And the thought came to us how cool would it be to have our daughter Kayla's endowment here at the Better Birds Temple? This would mean so much to Denise, uh, who had passed away. Um, they had been, Denise and Francis have, have been, had been temple workers um, there for uh, ever since the temple was open, so about 20 years. Um, so we called the temple, we reserved it, it was going to be on a Friday, or excuse me, Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m. This was the only time that we could get our whole family, it was really complicated. That was the time we could have everyone there, and before they all, to, all had to leave after the funeral. Uh, so Friday night, we went to bed um, knowing that three of our three cars, three of our children and their families, were driving all night to get here in time for the endowment. We woke up Saturday morning and realized that it, it had, there was a late snowstorm and um, three cars had been stranded in Wyoming. Or, yeah, all three of these cars had been stranded in Wyoming because of the late snowstorm. We realized that um, these three families would not be able to make it to the endowment, including our daughter Kayla. Um, we were devastated. We got on our knees and we prayed to Heavenly Father. We're like, wasn't this such a good righteous desire? And now it's not happening. 
Um, we ended our prayer, Tony got up and he says, I'm gonna drive and go see the, the um, Okishis. So he drove over there and saw the Okishis and, he, and they said, well, why don't we pre create our own endowment session? So about eight o'clock that night, everyone had finally arrived. Sister Okishi said, usually I like to have really prompt endowment sessions, but today we're gonna wait until every one of your children get there. We had the most amazing endowment session for my daughter. Um, Tony was with me, uh, my mother was with me, my father-in-law was with me, he was the officiator. All seven of our children in the trust for their evidence. It is a picture-perfect picture moment that we will never, ever forget. This is my line. So I ran the Winter Forest Bookstore in 2000 and 2007. And I was there when they broke ground for the Winter Forest Temple. I was being constructed, and I was in the special room with President Dingley during one of the dedicatory sessions. Later, I had the opportunity to work as a worker there in the temple for about seven years, and I can testify to you that the veil is very, very thin in the temple, where I had many very special experiences there that have changed my faith to sure knowledge of the reality of the spirit world and of the work and the importance of the work that we do there at the temple. I did the work for my departed son, Stephen, and I felt his presence most tangibly and powerfully. And I know that the Lord has walked the halls and has accepted his house. One day I hope to be able to work again in the temple once I retire. We appreciate the messages that have been and the testimonies that have been given so far. Uh, we now have a video from the Okiishis. Uh, they will be followed by the Deflers. And then uh, we'll finish up with our current temple president and matron, uh, president and sister Barbara. We'll go to that point. Good morning, everyone. Um, All right, we are so happy to be joined by Mother and Sister Oki Ishii. They are joining us by Miracle Technology uh, from their home in Ames, Iowa. Uh, and President Sister Oki Ishii served as temple president and matron from 2013 to 2016. And again, we are, we are so excited to have them here and be able to, to see and, and hear from them this evening. Uh, so we're, we're gonna turn the time over a little bit to them to, to talk about their memories and recollections. Uh, they've served in the temple starting from day one since the day it opened, and uh, so they have served uh, this entire time, and, and we're excited to hear about their, their memories and their recollections. So why don't I go ahead and just turn the time over to, to Brother and Sister Rodishi for the next few minutes. Thank you, Brother. It's really good to see all of you. Nice to see you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I wish you could, but you can see us, I hope. Uh, that's a good thing. We're so grateful for this invitation. I'm going to give you a little bit of history because that's what I do. Um, I'm a family historian by heart and by behavior when I can be. In 1997, our youngest um, went off to college and we then were able to qualify, at least in terms of our household, for us to try to apply as ordinance workers in what was then our temple district hall in Chicago. And we were blessed to be able to serve as ordinance workers in Chicago. It was a multilingual temple, lots of people coming from lots of parts of the world. It was very, very exciting. And a wonderful place because the people there took the time to help us be not only precise, but loving and caring. And when I say precise, that was important. Um, we had the privilege of serving with some of you in that temple as patrons and as ordinance workers. When we um, went there, we didn't realize that that would, temple would only be available to us for just a few more years. We served there for four years. And then on our last shift at the temple, the temple president, getting, telling us goodbye, uh, said, you'll know when you're um, when you're released and we thought okay fine we'll know when we're released and he told them how, how that release would come fast forward a little while and we were in the papillion state center people from our Ames Iowa state were assigned to sit in the papillion state center for the winter fortress temple dedication and when we were there i remember what i think was a silent preview prelude 
I'm not sure if it was silent, but I don't recall hearing music. What was in the front of the chapel was a, probably a PowerPoint, but it was a rotating PowerPoint of the temples, photos of temples from around the world. And when the Chicago temple photo came out, my heart went, ah, oh, because I remembered what the, what the temple president had said in Chicago when we left. When the Winter Fortress Temple is dedicated, you will be released from serving in Chicago. And then right after that, a beautiful picture of the Winter Fortress Temple came up. And my heart, which was not able to process all of that beauty of a temple closer and Winter Quarters now, on top of being released. And I did the usual Ray of the issues thing when I'm overwhelmed with emotion. There were tears just streaming down my face and dripping all over my clothes. And I was wiping them away and digging into my husband's pocket for another tissue. And he would just get handing me tissues. He's got me to doing that. That's what we do. And that was just such a beautiful time. And I looked around the room and I realized that some of the people with whom we served in Chicago were in that room. And what I didn't know, and what I know now after these 20 years, is that not only we were privileged to know some of those people, we got to know their children and their grandchildren. Some of you were the grandchildren here of those people that we worked with. And additionally, we were honored to serve in the temple for some of your family members who were on the other side of the veil. Sometimes we have five, five generations or six generations of your family in the same session as you faithfully brought family ordinance cards to the temple to perform the work for them. That's such an honor, brothers and sisters. Oh, my sisters and brothers, I can't even begin to tell you how my heart just opened up to all of you and the wonderful, marvelous histories that you brought to the temple faithfully over and over again. It's such a joy to know that although we have not been in the temple together for a while, we have still been able to stay connected and will rejoice soon when we're back serving again together, our family members on both sides of the camp. Well, I, I just want to say that each time I have gone to the temple, I have gone there to find the Lord. Uh, and I found him in all of you. Uh, the patrons, the workers, and when I say workers, I don't just mean ordinance workers. I mean those who worked in the laundry, those who worked in keeping the temple clean, the volunteer cleaners who would come, uh, those who worked out on the grounds. Uh, it, it was just such a joy to me to find the Savior in each of you, uh, patrons. Those who worked in the temple office. Uh, Ray's coaching me here. She's whispering in my ear. I'm, I'm getting to these. I don't want to leave anybody out. You know, all the baptistry everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> if I had to single one person off from your, your state, and I don't think anybody would fault me for doing this, the temple mechanic who was there the whole time we served in the presidency. Uh, and I think probably before we did that. Brother Dylan, uh, you know, he deserves a special shout out because his job is uh, sort of not that well known because not many people go snooping around the temple or check for us or check for, you know, faith working or whatever. But he single-handedly, because he did work alone, it was a lonely job, kept the temple going. So I think we all owe him uh, a great deal of gratitude. I am grateful for what we find in the temple besides finding the Savior in each other. I'm grateful for the ordinances because they're so important. I'm grateful to have been privileged to perform some of those ordinances. I'm grateful for the opportunity I had to serve as a patron uh, for some of my kindred dead. Uh, everything about the temple just makes me feel good just talking about it now. I realized that the last time I was in the temple was March of 2020. It was the last time I went to the temple to do my shifts, the assigned shifts. And, you know, we said at that time, wow, this man 
pandemic is picking up steam. We might be gone for several months, and little did we know it would be more than a year. So like you, I look forward to the temples worldwide opening fully, and I'm willing to let the Lord prevail here. Uh, when it's his time to do it, he will do it. And for now, we're going to be 2B pretty soon, right? So there's going to be uh, the baptistry opening, and I think we're going to all scramble the, the reserve slots there. But, you know, maybe uh, before we know it, because it's safe to say that before we know it, we'll be going back fully, and that's going to be great. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I have a testimony of the temple. I'll bear my testimony and then I'll turn it over to me for a few seconds or minutes to do that. I believe in God the Father and I believe in His Son Jesus Christ. I can't afford not to believe. Uh, I've been taught enough and I've experienced enough that how could I not believe in a Heavenly Father and a Savior in Jesus Christ? I am willing to let God prevail because who else would I let prevail? Or what else would I let prevail? Nothing, nothing would prepare the living God prevail in my life. And I share that testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, my sweet sisters and brothers, my heart is so full because I can see your faces in my memory. And I'm so grateful that the Lord has allowed me to have that privilege of seeing uh, so many of you for so many years. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think the temple is about, is connecting families. And I've been joyful to find out that the Lord has let me know through some several um, digital presentations that we are related and some of us are about 10,000 one time removed or something like that. It's been joyful to find that out. The Lord has blessed us to be joyful in his work and may we find joy in whatever he asks us to do. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, President. I think we stayed within our time a lot. You did a wonderful job. We are so, so very grateful for, for both of you for the service that you provided us. Uh, during the time you're going to continue to do so, and we, we greatly look forward to seeing uh, both of you back in, back in the Winter Quarters couple and, and reuniting once again. So thank you to you both. We are very grateful for you. Thank you, President. Bye-bye. Well, we are humbled and very great, grateful to be among those other temple presidents and matrons that have, have served at the temple. What an honor that has been to be with each of you as well. I'd like to tell you a story. Um, it was in 2011. My husband was serving as a 70, and we were hosting President Van Elder Nelson in the Kansas City area for a priesthood leadership conference. And when um, there was a man whose wife had just given birth to twins, and they were number 10, 9 and 10 of their family. And one of those twins was in the hospital, critically, um, in a condition of criticalness with his heart. And so the father called Don and asked if there was any way that Dr. Nelson might be able to come to the hospital and offer a prayer, uh, give him a blessing. And of course, when Don presented that to Elder Nelson, he immediately wanted to do so. So together they went to the temple and they did give this little baby a blessing. Found out a couple of days later that the baby died. And so I wanna put that story just over here for just a moment. Uh, we all know the doctrine of scattering and gathering. We know that ancient Israel was scattered because of the choice that they made to turn away from God, to break the relationship with him. And so they were scattered, scattered all over the world. We also know about the wonderful doctrine of gathering as our prophet has been teaching so clearly that it is the greatest thing that we can be doing right now. Now that scattering and gathering are both collective. It's for all of us. 
but there is an individual scattering and gathering that takes place every single day. And so now I'll come back to that story. We don't know what that family chose to do after the death of their baby. We don't know if they chose to turn away from God because they were so there was a trial too great for them. We don't know if rather they chose to turn closer to, the, to God and be gathered unto him. But there is the rest of the story. Eight years later, we were serving as president and matron of the temple in winter quarters. And we received a call from the mother of this family. And her daughter was going to be sealed in the Winter Quarters Temple, and they wanted to know if Don would do the sealing. So we were thrilled to know that they were coming. On the day that they arrived at the temple, here was the entire family. And it was wonderful to meet the other twin, who was now eight years old. And the 12-year-old daughter, at the time of the blessing, who was now the one being sealed, to her companions for eternity. And it was a glorious gathering of this family, a gathering at the temple. And so that reminds me now of a scripture found in Isaiah 5. And now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and daughters. Therefore, I would that ye should be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in good works, that Christ, the Lord God omnipotent, may seal you his, that you may be brought to heaven, that ye may have everlasting salvation and eternal life through the wisdom and power and justice and mercy of him who created all things in heaven and in earth who is God above all. I testify that as you and I are immovable and steady and steadfast in gathering to our Savior, turning to him, obeying him, he will seal us to him. I testify that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How great it is for us to, to be here. I'll tell you, we've been so looking forward to, to coming back and just feeling of your spirit. Uh, <clears throat> Paul Harvey, some of you remember him, used to say, what's the rest of the story? Well, we've had several references made tonight to the faithfulness of the saints here traveling to Chicago and Dallas and so forth, St. Louis. Well, while that was taking place, I was serving as state president in Kansas City area. I wrote the same letter. <clears throat> and so Elder Pinnock was uh, there for a leadership meeting with our state presidency. And, and uh, the Winter Quarters Temple had been announced. And so I tried to tactfully ask him why. <laughs> Well, our, our Kansas City's much bigger and, you know, blah, blah, blah. He looked at me and said, President Deshler, the saints in that area are covenant keepers. They don't just talk it, they do it. He then gave me a listing of your bus trips and the remarkable service that you rendered leading up to the Lord's decision to place the temple here. That was a lesson from afar. When Carol and I came to serve here, we got to experience firsthand how special the saints within the Winter Quarters Temple District are. 
we felt of your deep commitment and love for the Lord. And we witnessed you fulfill your responsibilities as covenant keepers. And just to comment for a moment on how significant it is for us to be covenant keepers. <clears throat> we can't understand covenants in their full meaning without understanding first the love of our Heavenly Father. It is beyond anything we can comprehend. He weeps for us when we go astray. And then when we were separated because of the fall, everything in the plan was dedicated to having him reunite with each of us. Elder Holland said this, Covenants always deal with the central issue of why God and man are separated and how they can unite again. The Latin root for covenant is covenir, which means to unite, to come together. In short, all covenants are essentially about one thing, the atonement of Jesus Christ, the at one provided to every person, if we will but do all that we can to honor our covenants. Further, we know that covenants in essence are about relationships. Heavenly Father wants a relationship with each of his children. He desperately wants us to stay in the covenant path. Hence, he binds us, as Carol just read, he binds us to him and the Savior. And hence, through that, we are strengthened, we are given courage, we receive peace. Again, we were so profoundly blessed to witness and feel of your covenant consciousness, your covenant discipline, and your testimony of the Savior and all that takes place in the temple. May I conclude with this quote from Elder Holland. The very reason we go to temples is to bind ourselves to God and to be reminded of how important that relationship is and what we need to do to keep it solid. May we all commit ourselves wholeheartedly to doing that is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. wonderful to be here this evening to say that well it hasn't been easy to follow these wonderful people um, in the temple working in the temple for this evening as um, speaking to you and sharing our testimonies they are wonderful people and um, we're just grateful for heavenly father's love and for your love and um, forgiveness and accepting us for our shortcomings and for the way that we are it's been an interesting year, hasn't it? Temple service, as we knew it, went away about four months into our service in the temple. All of the temples in the world were closed due to the pandemic. And we all wonder, what are we going to do now? Well, slowly and thankfully, temples started opening in phases. And we were ever so grateful for each of those phases and could see the hand of the Lord in blessing all of us as each new phase opened up so that, that some temple work could be done. Let me share with you just a few of the miracles that we witnessed during this time, perhaps 
through COVID eyes as we were in the temple. What a sight it was to open the front door of the temple for a sealing party there, the group of what started as eight and then became 16. And the same for those coming to be endowed. It was started as a group of eight and then we were able to have a group of 16 and they would all be waiting at the door and we'd open the door for them. And they were almost giddy as they would come into the temple and so excited. And then as they came further into the temple behind the recommend desk, that reverence came to them as they realized who they were in the temple and they could feel the, the spirit of being in the temple. That was such a blessing to witness that every time. It was a blessing for each, each temple worker, each of us to minister one by one to those patrons that come to the temple. You know, the, when someone came to the temple for their endowment or their sealing, Everyone in the temple was there for them, for that person. We all knew their name. We all knew who was receiving their endowment. And everyone from the, the greeter, the, the front desk, the brother, and the recorder, and the temple presidency, and, and the office workers, we were all there for that one person. And it was such a blessing to minister one by one. Perhaps for me, the biggest tender mercy that I witnessed during this time is when the young brides um, would come to the temple to be sealed. Many had dreamed their whole life of this special temple sealing, this day that they, they were going to be participating in. And it was so impressive and inspiring to me to see that as they had to let that dream sort of go and um, follow their prophet and, and those things that had been made possible because of a living prophet and because Heavenly Father loves his, his children. Many of them were married civilly first um, against their dreams and their wishes. And how exciting it was when the temple would open up and opened up for sealings. And they all hurried and rushed to get their special sealing day. And um, when they came to the temple, that, that the day of their wedding, original day of their wedding was gone and all of the, the uh, stress that comes with the wedding, the reception if they were able to have one, the, the hair and the makeup and the bridesmaids and all of those details were behind them and they came to the temple that day and were able to so focus solely on their special sealing ordinance that they were participating in. It was such a testimony to me to see that the Lord's hand has been in all of this, all of this time. This week, as in tomorrow, our temple is going to open in what we call phase 2B, which means we're going to be having baptisms. Um, so that we're going to be able to bring our newly 12-year-old children and our um, newly our recent converts to the temple for the first time, and they're going to be able to experience the, the spirit and the reverence in the temple as they're able to uh, perform ordinances for those of their ancestors and, and friends and family on the other side of the veil. We're, we're so anxious for them to come and feel the spirit there and be able to um, have that opportunity. We miss seeing them, we miss seeing the light in their eyes as they look around bright-eyed their first time in the temple when they're, they're clutching those names of their ancestors in their hands that they're so anxious to do the work for. We've missed that and we're so excited for, for all of you to be able to have that opportunity to come as families and as young men and young women groups and friends to the temple and and participate in this great opportunity. God has prepared his people for this time. As Elder Bednar has expressed of this time, he said, quote, it was an opportunity to learn remarkable lessons. And it certainly has been, hasn't it, for each of us. We have learned so much. And I'm confident that one of those lessons that we have learned during this time is how much we love the temple and how important it is in our lives. President Nelson recently um, has asked us, and he said, quote, when these temporary COVID-19 restrictions are lifted, please schedule regular time to worship and serve in the temple 
Every minute of that time will bless you and your family in ways nothing else can, close quote. We love our temple. We miss seeing you in our temple. We look forward to the Winter Quarters Temple opening and for each of you to be able to come and participate in the, the peace and love and hope that is found in the temple. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, it's just wonderful to be with you this evening and to see these incredible brothers and sisters that we've attempted to follow. It's been a great joy, and we we have looked up to you. We, we respect you. We have the utmost respect for you, so we're, we're grateful to be with you this evening. Brothers and sisters, you heard from President Hales, and um, a thought occurred to me that I might um, have some cards printed, and rather than thank you, just on the front would say, I'm sorry. So if, it's, if I need to send in one of you those cards, let me know. I make my share of mistakes. Uh, you know, we read in the Doctrine and Covenants that um, section one, that the Lord often calls the weak things of the world to do his work. And uh, I'm, I'm evidence of that. We continue to be stretched. So we're grateful for you. When we were serving as restricted ordinance workers in the Chicago temple, I remember the first time that I officiated in a session, two of the very experienced workers walked in and I heard them, I overheard them talking about what, what was he doing? Did he know what he was doing? And clearly I didn't, and I'm still working on those things. So I, I appreciate your patience. Brothers and sisters, uh, President Jacob asked that I share just a few thoughts and comments from the dedicatory prayer. And I read the dedicatory prayer often. We were there in the sluster room when it was read by President Hankley. And it can be found on the homepage of uh, Winter Quarters Temple. It's right there at the bottom, dedicatory prayer. And you can read that, you can, you can save a copy. Uh, it's an incredible prayer and blessing. And I would encourage you to do that. And I'll just read two or three excerpts from that uh, dedicatory prayer. The first is this, um, and I quote, we thank thee for prophet Joseph Smith to whom the temple ordinances were revealed, unquote. So brothers and sisters, I bear you my testimony that as we read in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 110, days, I think seven days on April 3rd, seven days after the Kirtland Temple was dedicated, the veil in the, the, the uh, Kirtland Temple where this vision was received was, was uh, thinned, it was removed, this is often the case in the temple, including the Winter Quarters Temple, and we read the following. Another great and glorious vision burst upon us for Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time has fully come, which was spoken by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he should, sent, he should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. And so I bear you my testimony that uh, the sealing power continues to be on the earth today. President Iring extended the call when we were still in, in Boise serving, and we were humbled, uh, humbled at the privilege that it would be to hold the sealing authority, the power to seal on earth the things that would be bound in heaven. Next quote, the ground on which this sacred structure stands was hallowed a century and a half ago by the suffering of thy saints. We dedicate the ground on which it stands, ground which has already been made holy by those who long ago were buried here. We make the cemetery as part of these grounds together with all the vegetation growing thereon. Unquote. So brothers and sisters, um, when the excavation started uh, for the Winter Quarters Temple, they found the remains of two individuals outside of the boundaries of the temple during the excavation. And so they called me and, and asked that we, uh, the, the company, prepare um, 
coffins, caskets, coffins, to hold the remains of these two individuals. Now, I, I wasn't there when they were exhumed, but it was quite a process. The county coroner needed to be present. They needed to, to contact the descendants of those that had uh, passed away and, and been buried outside of the, the boundaries of the cemetery. And I'm told that um, the one, there was one male and one female. Uh, the, the, the remains of the male had deteriorated, but interestingly enough, the, the, the dress and the colors of the dress was still uh, visible with the sister that had been buried those decades earlier. So um, I think it's fairly widely, like widely known, and I, I hope that you would forgive a personal reference, but um, I proposed to my wife in July of 77, Okay, and, 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 I, and I did that in the cemetery and I know exactly where we were seated. I don't think that I knelt, but I did propose and I told her that I did that because it was the most spiritual place that I could imagine uh, or find where we lived. And I believe that to this day, brothers and sisters, the, that, that ground was already made holy by those that have gone before. Next quote, now the generations have come and gone, our people have left here, then for reasons of employment, they slowly return. Today we have stakes and wars with large congregations, songs of thanksgiving fill our hearts, crowning all is the presence of a temple on this hallowed ground. Elder Kevin S. Hamilton, the first quorum of the 70 presided over the Miller State Conference a few weeks ago. And he made this statement, brothers and sisters. He said that he was confident that the Savior has walked in the halls of the Winter Borders Temple. And when he said that, then one of my favorite songs, hymns came to mind. I, I walk today where Jesus walked. And if you think about that, brothers and sisters, it, it would be quite a distance to go to Jerusalem and Bethlehem or the Savior walk. But I testify to you that it's his house, that he has walked the halls of his house. Brothers and sisters, it's a, it's a great privilege to serve with you in the temple. We invite everyone within the sound of my voice to come to the temple. Um, dear President Oaks read one of the quotes. We pray for all those who serve on, in, in any capacity and ask that thou wilt touch the hearts of thy people with great desire to come frequently to thy holy house. So that, that is my invitation to you. It's the Lord's house. In reality, brothers and sisters, he invites us to come to his house. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, just a couple of uh, brief closing remarks. And then following my, my remarks, there will be a, a closing musical number, uh, Come, Come, Ye Saints. Uh, and our closing prayer will be offered by, by Brother Harkness, uh, one of our temple sealers. Um, the font will be full uh, this week. Um, for the first time in a long time, and not just with water, uh, but with youth that have been longing to return to the temple, and not just with youth, but with spirits of people who have waited a little extra long uh, that we could do their work for them. And what a great event. Uh, and I hope that we have um, great anticipation for the day when we can attend the temple more fully. Uh, and to look forward to that day with, with great enthusiasm. I want to add my invitation uh, to President Bartlett that uh, we prepare ourselves to, uh, to enter the temple once more, and we look forward to that day. I want to close with my testimony that, that I know that God lives, that his son is Jesus Christ, uh, that this is his work that is done within the, within the sacred halls of the temple. Uh, and I leave you that my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
we give praise to thee. But we know thee. And that thou dost love us. <clears throat> and desires us. To return to thee. We're grateful for thy son. Who plays such a important part in this whole process process of the plan of love and salvation for us we're grateful to be here tonight to experience this review of the past history of our temple we're grateful for thy influence in thy presence, as well as the influence and the presence of thy Holy Son, whom we love, that has been in the temple while we've been there. For the sacred experiences that we have had, and for the opportunity to grow in love for thee and thy Holy Son. We pray that thou wilt bless all of those who are in our temple area that their desires and their hearts might be to attend and draw closer to thee through their attendance in the temple. We pray that thou will bless us that we might have a continued desire to be bound to thee, that our spirits might be such that we will shun those influences that would keep us away. We appreciate those who participated and those who planned this meeting and pray that God will bless them for their, for their participation, for their efforts. Again, we express our great love and pray for thy continued blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.